Pope Francis is planning to visit the Philippines January 15th to the 19th. We'll speak with a Filipino bishop about the Pope's intentions to bring mercy and compassion to a land so recently ravaged by multiple natural disasters. So please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle, and welcome to EWTN Live, which is our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight has come a long way. He is the chair of the Episcopal Philippine Commission for Social Communication and Media. And he's here with us tonight to share with us his country's plans to welcome Pope Francis and to bring healing to a strongly Catholic land shaken to its core by deadly earthquake and typhoon. So please welcome from the Diocese of Pasig in the Philippines, Bishop Milo Vergara. Excellency, welcome. Father Mitch. Good to have you here. Yes. Where is your Diocese of Pasig? How uh, in relationship, say, to Manila? Oh, well, it's, it's actually within Metro Manila. Oh. Uh, yes, because uh, before, uh, the Archdiocese of Manila included the district of Pasig. I see. So it was only in uh, 2003 when uh, there were the creation of uh, other small dioceses that became now the suffragans of the Archdiocese of Manila. Okay, just so, somewhat the way that uh, Brooklyn is a suffragan diocese right. to New York, and so is Long Island, and so on. Yes. All right, uh, Rockwell Center. Um, so, the, so your diocese is close to Manila, and Manila is your hometown. Oh, oh yes, actually, um, I was born in Manila. <laughs> I was born in Manila, but uh, I grew up in Pasig. I see. For 10 years, we were there, and then we transferred somewhere in Quezon City, which was also a district of the uh, Archdiocese of Manila before. Yes, yeah, so we, a lot of us have heard of Quezon City. Yes. Uh, and of course, you went to the Ateneo. Oh yes, I was schooled by the Jesuits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they sent me here, just to make sure we don't give you jug. <laughs> Attention for those who didn't go to Jesuit schools. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, it's great to have you here. And this is very exciting news uh, that uh, Pope Francis is planning to make this pastoral visit to the Philippines. Uh, he, this is going to be the fourth pastoral visit by a pope. Yes, yes. First was Pope Paul VI back in 1970. Yes. And that's, you were a fairly small oh, yes. child at that time. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, in your adulthood, Pope uh, John Paul, St. John Paul II, had gone there uh, in what, 81? 81, right. And then again in 95. Yes. And one of the things I, I was aware of is that the Pope John Paul's Mass in the Philippines is still on record as the largest single gathering of human beings in the history of the world. Right. And that, that, that the faith of the people of the Philippines mm. just poured out into the streets. Yeah, five million people. Yes. That's why we're looking forward to the visit of Pope Francis. Yes. We well. don't know if it will double up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it yeah. Well could. But the territory is the same, so sure. we could just imagine uh, how we would fill the, the, the whole place. Now, given this, um, the, uh, the, the, have you spoken with officials at the Vatican or with the Pope about what is the intention of Pope Francis 
uh, another judge will come there to keep tabs on the Jesuit graduates. Uh, is uh, what is the, um, uh, the the purpose from their perspective? Oh well, basically. Uh, this is like an apostolic visit, but it will also be considered a state visit because the Holy Father is a head of state of the Vatican. Yes. You know? So uh, he just visited uh, Korea, yes. as we all know, and uh, he really has uh, had that intention to visit the Philippines as mm -hmm. Cardinal Tagle has been sharing with us and uh, telling Cardinal us. Cardinal Tagle is? Cardinal Tagle of Manila. Okay, yes. okay. a lot of our viewers don't yes, know. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Cardinal Tagle of Manila has been uh, sharing that in his conversations with the Holy Father, uh, he has been uh, really uh, in touch with what has been happening uh, and what has happened before given this uh, uh, Typhoon Haiyan, which for the Philippines is called Typhoon, the Super Typhoon Yolanda. No? And, uh, yeah, so th in, in the Philippines, they named this Typhoon Yolanda. Yolanda. By Super Typhoon, what, what does that mean? Well, uh, usually you have many signals for typhoons, like uh, it's up to signal number three, but a super typhoon like this goes over three. You know? yes. And uh, uh, because of the storm surge that uh, they have predicted, it like covered the whole archipelago, but it hit uh, the Visayas, you know? mm -hmm. especially in... Uh, Vi Visayas are... Uh, the, because there are three islands, Luzon, yes. Visayas, and Mindanao. You know? okay. and, uh, it hit the Visayas region. No? Okay, and so, uh, and this was uh, a, a, a few hundred people died during that typhoon. Like and a thousands. A thousand? Thousands. Actually, uh, uh, last uh, June, I had the opportunity to uh, visit the uh, mass grave where they say uh, almost 10,000 people were, were buried. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So this was a, a huge number of people to die in national uh, disaster. Yes, yes. And, and in addition to the uh, deaths, there was also a lot of devastation of houses, infrastructure, lack of water, food, etc. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, there have been many relief and now rehabilitation efforts um, of uh, the devastations done to the houses and especially schools and churches. No? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you see in the Philippines, not only big churches, but you know, when you go to the, the barrios, there are chapels no, where the priests go to also celebrate Mass during Sunday. Mm -hmm. And these two were destroyed. No? Mm -hmm. So you could imagine what has happened. And uh, the livelihood of the people uh, were actually wiped away because of this typhoon. And also, in October of 2013, there was another devastating uh, earthquake right. uh, that occurred. And uh, again, a couple hundred people died there. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, th this happened in Bohol. No? Bohol. Bohol. No? And uh, where, where is uh, that? Uh, it's actually in still in the Visayas region. No? Uh, it's. Uh, uh, because there are two parts in Bohol, Tagbilaran and uh, uh, Talibon. No? Mm -hmm. um, the dialect spoken there is Ilongo. No? Uh -huh. So it's, it's not the, the Tagalog that we yes, normally yes, associate yes. with the Philippines. There are many dialects, of course. Yeah, no? right, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, and um, uh, many churches really crumbled mm -hmm. no? and, uh, because they were built on limestone. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, and... Um, uh, because of this, uh, this earthquake, no, um, many people too suffered. Sure. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, quite uh, a, a double whammy. You have one of the deadliest earthquakes in qu a few decades, and then you've also got this typhoon. And so this double disaster is certainly something that is evoking the, the, the Pope's interest and concern for the folks in the Philippines. Yes, and that's why I think the theme for the people visit is mercy and compassion. Mm -hmm. It is because um, uh, we feel the, the compassion of the Holy Father for the Filipino people. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
as we know, the, the word compassion stems from two Latin terms, cum and passio, which is to suffer with. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this uh, um, makes us feel that we are not alone. We have the, the Pope, Pope Francis, suffering with us too. Mm -hmm. And uh, his uh, intention and his plan to go to the Philippines is uh, a gesture no, of how he wants to touch base with us no, mm -hmm. and to really suffer with us and to make sure that this suffering no, would uh, uh, be in a way a redemptive form of experience also, mm -hmm. making us see how uh, in the presence of the Holy Father, uh, Christ is with us and giving us hope. See, you, you bring up something that's a very important component of you know, Christianity, that just because you suffer, it doesn't mean that life therefore has to end. Right. Suffering is a part of life. I mean, you experience in, the, in an island nation like the Philippines, just as they do in Indonesia and Malaysia and so on, Earth is a dangerous place. There are a lot of risks from storms and earthquakes. There's a lot of change. And just because you suffer, it doesn't mean you say, well, I got to give up, it's all over. It's mm. not the way it is, is it? Yes, I think um, it is because of the faith of the Filipino people that we view, view suffering in a different uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Let me just share to you one uh, uh, story. Um, you know, during the end of the year of faith that was simultaneously done in all dioceses, as uh, we celebrated it in year, uh, the year uh, 2012, we opened it in right. 2012 going to, the, to 2013. Uh, when we closed that uh, year of faith and Typhoon Yolanda Hayan, the international name came. Uh, there was one testimony from uh, a seminarian. No? His name is James Santos, who shared uh, his, uh, his painful experience. Uh, Typhoon Yolanda happened in November 2013, and his parents were living uh, in Manila, no? somewhere in Quezon City. Uh, then they decided that they would retire and go back to Tacloban Leyte, where Typhoon Yolanda really hit. That was like the decision came June, and uh, they went home to take care of their grandchild. You know? And um, it was really tragic because they've been living in the metropolis you know, for a long time with their work, and then just deciding to retire and go back home. You know? was something they look forward to, you know, like a homecoming. Sure. And then Yolanda came. Both of them died. Their bodies no, have not been seen. And uh, like the many others that have been washed away by the storm surge, uh, they're missing. The bodies are missing. Now, James was sharing this story, his pain. But then he also shared that he put in his Facebook account his favorite picture with his parents, and he put a caption there, till we meet again in heaven. Yeah. That's faith. And that's one of the realities of our faith that always puts such suffering in a perspective that suffering here on earth is difficult. You, know, you, you yeah. can't you know, underestimate it. You can't say, oh, it's irrelevant. It is relevant. But when we have the perspective of heaven, we also see it's very short. You know, it lasts just a tiny, tiny moment of time. Our life is short compared yes. to eternity, and the suffering within it is even shorter yet. So this is a, a, an important perspective that seems to permeate the Philippine culture because of its strong Catholic uh, uh, quality. Yes, and you, you have to be a believer. You know? um, I remember there was a picture I saw in the, in the internet you know, of uh, the, the devastations that happened in Bohol when there was an earthquake 
and of course in uh, in Leyte no? because of Typhoon Yolanda. Mm -hmm. But the images were striking because there was one uh, uh, picture that showed the rubble of a church in Bohol. Mm -hmm. But what stood was the image of the Blessed Mother. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You see, and that's faith. Uh, expressed no, even in social media. Right. And then here, um, there was this uh, other image of people suffering given the, the typhoon, but they were carrying the, the images of the Santo Nino, no? the, and the, holy, the, holy, the, child the holy child Jesus and their crucifixes, holding on to their faith amid suffering. Yes. So they would not end up in despair, but hope. Right. Right, mm -hmm. and you know it, it's the the world uh, community certainly did come to the help of the Philippines, but as is often the case with such disasters, after a certain period, the news cycle shifts to other issues, and it can be forgotten. Well, the people still have to continue rebuilding. Yes. Uh, but you know, I, I, let me share to you that because you brought up this uh, this compassion also of the world, you know, mm -hmm. since we, we were talking about the compassion of Pope Francis, uh, there's another striking uh, incident that, that really touched my heart because in, in Tacloban, in the Diocese of Palo Leyte, uh, one church was really destroyed. It's called the Santo Nino Church. Okay. And you know who put up money to rehabilitate it? The Chuchi Foundation, the Buddhists. Is that right? Yes. They, they pledged 30 million pesos uh -huh. to build, to rebuild the, the structure of the church. Uh -huh. So um, you see, it's belief in God. No? It's, uh, uh, you see here uh, uh, faith at work you know, in different perspectives. Mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. but all pointed towards uh, uh, humanity, trying to restore humanity, also looking at our own accountability, knowing what's ahead of us. You know, I, I can almost hear uh, s comments of some secular people. In fact, I, I can imagine easily some of the cynical comments of secularists in the West who might say, why are you rebuilding those churches? There are other issues, but it's precisely the church from which that hope that energizes the, all the people, the clergy, the religious, the laity, to say, this is why we do rebuild our faith and the hope that God gives us. And so that this is an extremely important reason to rebuild. Yeah, because we draw strength from no one else but God. No? Yeah. So uh, you look at the church, no? uh, icons or symbols no, that uh, motivates us to deepen our faith mm -hmm. and to have hope. Yes. So I think even uh, people from other religions recognize that. Yes. And Thanks. because of this uh, recognition, then they want to contribute to revitalize the faith of other religions. Yeah, it, 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 Buddhists always strike me as a people filled with great respect for others. They, 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 uh, they uh, as a community, they, they seem to have that sense of respect and that they would build a church, not say, oh, we'll build a Buddhist temple instead. No, they built a Catholic church that, you know, because of their sense of respect for the way that the Christian faith operates in the, the society of the Philippines. I think this is also a clear testimony that gone are the days of proselytizing, mm -hmm. that, you know, I want you to change your faith, mm -hmm. but here I respect your faith, and because I am also inspired by your faith, and perhaps you may be inspired by my own faith, mm -hmm. then uh, we have what we call this uh, s drawing strength from mm -hmm. each other's uh, experience of mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. I think that's dialogue of life. Mm -hmm. The 
Federation of Asian Bishops some years ago recognized that no? uh, because uh, they were able to see the dialogue of life, the interplay from other religions no? in Asia no? and yeah. seeing what is good so that they can be able to do good things and holy things directed to God. Yeah. Yeah, it, it certainly uh, the other culture, the Philippines is the first Christian nation of Eastern Asia. Yes. And now Korea, South Korea anyway, is well on its way towards that. They really move, the, the, the Christian uh, conversion is really occurring very strongly throughout South Korea. Uh, and they can't do it fast enough because their population is beginning to see they have one of the lowest birth rates. Yeah. And they're, 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 they and Japan are both in experiencing great difficulties as the population decreases. But, you know, in the other cultures that a wide variety of religions have formed those cultures. So when Christians are engaged in those other societies, that are Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain, and so on, that we have to encounter, you know, these things as well. Yeah. Now, I'd like to uh, return to the Pope's visit. Um, he, again, he wants to, you know, engage the Philippine Church on this level of compassion in their suffering uh, and suffering with. Um, are there any other expectations that people might have for this visit? Well, for the Filipino people, just for the Holy Father to visit the P Philippines, no, uh, I think uh, uh, gives them strength in faith and hope in, uh, in their own life experience. No? Mm -hmm. So their expectation is simple. Mm -hmm. The Pope will visit. Yeah. Uh, just to see the Pope is like seeing God, yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, I think that makes us all excited. No? Yeah. Uh, there has no, not been any official statement yet from the Vatican on the detailed schedule yeah. of uh, the Holy Father's uh, uh, visit. However... Uh, that will come. Yeah, so that will come, time. that will yeah. come. But I think uh, whatever happens, uh, whether you see the Pope live celebrating Mass, like what happened to Pope John Paul or St. John Paul II when he was in the Philippines. The largest crowd in the history of yes, the world. Yes, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Or uh, perhaps you see him on TV delivering a speech you know, to whatever group. Uh, I think that's grace. Yeah. yeah. That for the Filipino people or for any Filipino, Catholic no, is, uh, is already a blessing. Yeah. And, you know, it's something about the Philippines, too. Uh, historically, until you know, the last hundred years or so, um, the, the Philippines were a place fairly remote from the, the, the minds, the, the, the thinking of most of the rest of the world. Of course, it's known in Eastern Asia, but you know, the Europeans were not making you know a beeline to the Philippines in the 1600s and 1700s, 1800s. This is now there are more, but it was it's a remote set of islands, and this, like as so many people experience elsewhere, is a, a link with the Vicar of Christ the visible head of the church on earth coming to the Philippines and making this, no, 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 you're not remote from us. You are in our hearts. And that's a very important element as well. Uh, it's good you said that, no? but I think uh, if you try to reflect also on the words of St. John Paul II no? when he was still living no? and uh, uh, his own uh, vision of church. Mm -hmm. And I think Pope Francis also recognizes this, mm -hmm. that uh, the new missionaries would really come from Asia, especially mm -hmm. the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, our overseas Filipino workers who have gone to work in different parts of the globe, mm -hmm. 
especially in Europe, mm -hmm. they have been so active in church. Yes. They have been filling the church. So uh, I think this is uh, something to consider also you know, in terms of uh, uh, this era of new evangelization. I, I also am aware uh, that many Fil Filipinos have come throughout the Middle East. Yes. Not only are they very much living their faith, I mean, uh, a, a number of countries allow them to be able to worship. Not all nations do. Saudi Arabia doesn't allow any churches. Mm -hmm. But they, they are very active in many countries, yes. uh, including Israel. Yes. Uh, there, there are many Filipinos there. And you also see that there have been Filipino martyrs for the faith. Uh, I, I remember um, when I was in Jordan, uh, a couple women had gotten, Filipino women, had gotten caught with Bibles in Saudi Arabia and were beheaded. They lost their faith mm -hmm. because they, they dared to bring a Bible with them. So it, it's, it's vibrant living of the faith, even to the point of vibrant being willing to die for the faith. Yes. Um, when I was ordained a priest in 1990, so I, my first assignment was parochial <coughs> vicar of uh, a parish. No? Um, there was this lay minister who was so active in that parish and uh, uh, worked in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And uh, he still became an active lay minister underground. Mm -hmm. And you know what he did? He would tape my homilies. No? And uh, it was just a cassette tape. No? But uh, during like a prayer service no, and uh, uh, the way they would be able to give uh, uh, a liturgical uh, activity also mm -hmm. to give Holy Communion, this was the breaking of the word and the breaking of the bread for them. Mm -hmm. They could not do it publicly. No, yeah, no, no, yes, no. Yes, it's but forbidden. Yes, but uh, you would see uh, how many Filipinos in the Middle East you know, would be serving the church, even underground. Yes, that's right. And, and again, at risk of their lives or prison. Yes. You know, but, but the, the, the faith is very much alive. And you know, so this, there really is this great, and of course, we in the United States are very alert to the liveliness of the Filipino community throughout this, uh, the United States. Um, oftentimes, they're very, very active in their parishes and uh, are you know, outdoing many folks who were born in this country. I want to take a little bit of a break. Uh, we're going to do that for a couple minutes. Uh, but let me also mention that if you want to get more information on the papal visit to the Philippines, which will be January 15th to the 19th. You can go online to find more, out more about it by going to www.papalvisit.ph. Papalvisit.ph. And the PH is for, of course, the Philippines. Also, you can check out with EWTN.com, our website, and we, too, will carry information about that pastoral visit. Uh, it's, you know, it's, we, we love to make these pastoral visits available to the whole world. That's one, one part of our mission. So um, we'll have some of that information available, too. So we'll, we'll come back in just about two minutes and get a number of questions and comments and continue our discussion with uh, Bishop Vergaro. So please stay with us.
Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. First of all, I want to um, uh, bring up that uh, we love to have you come here on pilgrimage. Now, if Bishop Vergaro can come all the way from the Philippines, you can certainly come down here yourselves, and we'd love to have you in our studio audience. If so, please contact our pilgrimage department by calling them at 205-271-2966. Or you can go to our website, EWTN.com. They will give you all kinds of information about the scheduling of programs with a room for to be in the studio audience, um, scheduling of the masses, most importantly, information on how to get up to Hansville to visit the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, and places to stay and places to eat. Now, see, uh, you know, we, we have different food than you do in the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, but um, we, we've got some pretty good stuff here in Alabama. Uh, we've got fried green tomatoes. You probably don't eat that in the Philippines, but it's a good thing to try when you're down here in the United <laughs> States, uh, especially in the, the southern state of <laughs> Alabama. So uh, do come and join us if you can. We'd appreciate it very much. All right, let's take, we have a question from our studio audience to begin with. Ma'am, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Troy, Michigan. Troy, Michigan. Were you born there? Uh, no, I was born in the Philippines. I thought so. <laughs> and what is your question? Uh, my question, I'm a physician, and so my question has to do with uh, contraception and uh, abortions in the Philippines, how it, it, it would translate into abortions in the Philippines. Uh, and I've been following that here, and um, most recently, uh, my understanding is that that law had been passed over the objections and all that of all the bishops. Yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering where the update is on that and how it's being um, translated in the, in the life of you know, the faithful and uh, the practitioners, the physicians in particular. Excellency? Yeah, good. Uh, actually, in the, in the past years, uh, the RH law has been a controversial issue uh, not only for the Catholic Church, but for the Filipinos. No? And uh, uh, we have been lobbying against the RH law. RH? RH law. What does RH uh, uh, mean? Reproductive health law. Okay, reproductive health. Before it was a reproductive health bill. Now it's a law, as you said. No? So I think uh, um, it has gone through many revisions because of uh, the debates no, and the fora uh, that has uh, transpired uh, not only between uh, among groups no but also uh, between lawyers no and also as it has uh, uh, been passed into law but uh, i think what we have to be concerned about right now no is uh, uh, the rh law is different from the rh laws in different states you know we're a catholic country and because of our catholic lobbyists no we have a sort of, uh, uh, at least, no, um, gone into strides into making sure, quote unquote, that the RH law has, uh, in a way, safeguards, especially against abortion. No? Um, there have been many things stricken out no, as it has been reviewed, no, and uh, uh, we have been briefed about it. Uh, in terms of contraception, it has been made clear also you know, that as the government will be offering an ar array of uh, uh, what can be used for uh, uh, the means of contraception. Me yeah, means of contraception. Natural fa family planning is uh, a part of it. No? So mm -hmm. I think that's how the state rules. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we're concerned, yes, no, and uh, you see when uh, laws ha are passed, uh, it's very clear to us that uh, the problem we have is uh, how the law will be interpreted, mm -hmm. no? and uh, what will happen once uh, reproductive health is passed into law, mm -hmm. and uh, 
the interpretations that would be executed. No? So we're concerned. No? Excellency, let me bring up something that is uncomfortable for me as okay. an American okay. in this regard. But it, was it not the case that the Obama administration was tr making it clear to the president of the Philippines that American foreign aid was attached to passing this law? Uh, true. Uh, you know, exactly I, yeah, true. Exactly because true. Yes. this is exactly what the elitist and evil politicians in this administration and other administrations, uh, that not all of them, but this is what they do. They look at the third world and say, we'll give you money for your economy if you let us teach your women to kill their children. The, and this mm. is something that is in their mindset. So in the mindset of the Obama administration from the beginning. And one of the problems is charity to the poor is very important. But when our American government attaches that kindness with an evil act, politicians in the Philippines should say, what are these people up to? Why are they giving me a gift on the condition that I teach our women to try not to have babies or to even kill them in the womb? Doesn't that strike you as a politician in the Philippines that the big brother is up to no good? And that's what they should have thought of. And I, that's what I would get. I, I, I remember when this was going on, I talked about it because I know we get watched in the Philippines. And this is something that the Filipino people need, need to pay attention to and see the problem in terms of the American government try, doing this all over the world, all over Africa, the Caribbean, yes. Latin America. They don't care what country it is. If you are in a third world country, we want, we'll give you stuff if you are willing to get your women to kill the children or have contraception to prevent them. And that's something that has struck me as a very evil policy by our government. That's well said. No, I think uh, uh, even when there was this debate about the reproductive health bill before mm -hmm. it was passed to law and even after, even during the postscript, even until now, this has been brought up. No? Mm -hmm. So it's really a problematic. And I think I would just keep hammering at that yeah. issue because even when they call it the reproductive health law, they're, you, they're playing games with words like they do with pro-choice. Right. When that means pro-abortion in favor of cutting children apart in the womb. That's what they don't want to say. This is their manipulation of terms that they always do. And this is where the immorality gets slid through yeah. in the name of, yeah, we get all this other good stuff. Yeah. It's actually ex exploitation of the poor. Exactly what it is, because they don't really want the poor around. Yes. Let me also give a little suggestion. We've gone through this. Okay. So we've set, in this country, set the stage for what happens. And what I would urge you to bring back to your brother bishops in the Philippines to let the people know, in 1970-71, when the contraceptive pill was approved by our Federal Drug Administration, sales went way up. So did sales of other contraceptive devices. And this was done to say, well, we'll reduce the number of unwanted pregnancies, right? That's the propaganda. Yes. The reality was the number of unwanted births, the un, which means unplanned, but they're also unwanted, went from in 1960, where 5% of all children were born out of wedlock, 
since the sales of birth control and contraceptives increased, it went up to 43% of children born out of wedlock. The number of abortions also went up, not down, Yes, because they, they make this up. And the, another dirty little secret they don't like to say talk about, but the people infected by sexually transmitted right. diseases also skyrocketed, as did the number of diseases. So none of this was true. It didn't prevent any of this. Yeah. And this is what few people will say. And this is what we as the church have to say. This is medical fact, right. statistical fact. And, and let our people know, don't let the Americans trick your government into doing not only the harm of destroying your children, but also the harm that will come on other ways you don't even think will happen yet. But it's because people take more risks, they get into bigger trouble. You know, since time immemorial, they have been barking and thinking of population control, right? <laughs> yes. That has been always, you know, the like the battle cry, population control. Right. This has been the strategy. This has been like uh, the only thing you can do. You know? right. Now, if you try to also look after... Especially for people it, you don't like. Yeah. People you think are lower than you. Yeah, true. But you see, as, as if you look at what has happened in the past and go through it now, looking at now, there are complicated issues and perspectives we also have to consider. If you, if you recall, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth uh, points out the problem of relativism. Right. See, and it's an issue that uh, also is a mindset that becomes problematic, and uh, because also of that uh, uh, perspective, that type of thinking, moral relativism, you have your own choice, uh, you have your own autonomous freedom to do this. You want the easy way out. So everything becomes uh, um, so accessible, something that you can do. And you look at Freud and the pleasure principle, mm -hmm. I would rather resort to this than do continence, mm -hmm. than make a sacrifice. That's right. Uh, so it becomes really a come on for states, for propagandists you know, who uh, promote this mindset you know, about uh, population control, and also dealing with the exploitation of poverty. Uh, I, would, I would rather put it this way, um, even though it may be uh, a long-term process, I think we have to be more proactive in evangelization. A formation, a catechesis, must be seriously dealt with by the shepherds, by the church, by the lay people, because you already have a law, see? It's allowed, so what do you do? You go into communities, try to evangelize families, make sure your, your Catholic schools no, have the Catholic moral principles that uh, uh, those studying will truly understand and imbibe. I think a more proactive uh, process though it will be long-term, mm -hmm. uh, could be something that should be seriously thought of by the church. And, you know, with that, you know, the, the church has a, a good history of pointing out when laws are evil laws. You know, uh, Pope Pius XI condemned Nazism, the nationalism, the racism, the anti-Semitism in his great encyclical, Met Brennan de Zorge. And the, he laid it all out. And even if the world doesn't listen, we have to lay it out and say, an evil is evil. And we may not cooperate with that evil. And I think, you know, something that you said earlier about how the faith of the Philippine people, that they, that also gave them hope in the midst of horrible tragedies. Yes. Mm -hmm. They could overcome that. And, you know, calling people to see, 
Yeah, it is hard. You know, you know, to take care of children. Sometimes yeah. it seems impossible. But I remember my mother in her last Christmas said, I have no idea how we fed everybody, but we did. God took care of us. And I'm, I only wish I had more of you. You know, mm -hmm. that, that was her dying uh, regret that she didn't have more kids. And I, because all the stuff goes away but your family is there with you. Yeah. And, this is, this, and, and a family that trusts in God is there with you. And this is something that I think we have to say about evil laws. Yes. This is evil. Here's the good. I also like to point out, you, you mentioned from time immemorial mm -hmm. that people have tried to, you know, population control. Few people realize that the increase of abortion and then infanticide, especially of girls mm -hmm. in the Roman Empire in the third century made the population radically go down so that when the barbarians attacked them, they couldn't defend themselves. And that was one, one factor among many in the collapse of Rome. And we all have to be aware. It was the Christians who would not do contraception or birth control. Both were forbidden from the first century. They continued. The church they tried to execute is still here. Yes. The Roman Empire is gone. Good to remind politicians <laughs> that that's their fate, too. But, you know, I'd just like to go back to moral relativism because this is the brilliance of Pope Benedict XVI. Absolutely. You know, he, he is able to analyze moral relativism and not fear it. You know why? I think if you just look and read through his writings, he would point out you know, that, yes, no, uh, people think in pluralistic ways. You can think about anything. You can hold on to anything because everything is relative. But a time will come when what will stand out and should stand out will be the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you said, yep. evil is wrong. It, See? It, it's all, evil is always a deprivation of what is good. The good is primary. Evil is taking it out of context or diminishing it. And evil always undoes itself. So the absolute truth would stand out exactly. amidst all relativistic truths. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I, I oftentimes use the episode when Jesus saw the naked man among the tombs who was possessed by a legion of demons. And they said, cast us into the pigs, don't send us back to hell. <laughs> and they go to the pigs, what do they do? They destroy the pig. <laughs> this is the nature of evil. They are always self-destructive self-destructing as well as anybody else around them and the only eternal truth will stand exactly yes and you know i think this is part of the joy that pope francis will be bringing to the philippines that he knows you know he he stood up against plenty of evils yeah. of sometimes very violent types as well as uh, immorality in the government and such stood strong and came out a man as we see filled with humility and peace and i'm sure he's going to bring that quality to his pastoral visit in the philippines yeah and we look forward to that you know uh, just to think about it evangelii godium came out uh, and uh, the joy of the gospel and yes. that's how pope francis know would uh, sort of uh, uh, manifest himself, no? <laughs> exactly. his person, his teachings, the joy of Christ. No? I think that would touch base with the Filipino people because the Filipino people are joyous people. They are. Amid suffering, we're resilient. No? You know, I remember uh, um, many years ago, I attended an ordination in the north up the mountains and there was this uh, also big storm that came and we could not go down the mountain. There were floods even in the mountainous region. That was like uh, in the north of uh, Luzon, mm -hmm. one of the islands. Sure. No? Sure. And um, 
when we were our bus was passing the flooded areas no uh, you would see filipinos no uh, bringing their pigs no even uh, their chickens and smiling saving them no yeah. amid suffering yeah and uh, uh, you see this is the resilience that uh, I think uh, the Filipino has in term the Filipino people have in terms of their culture, in terms of their faith, their character. Yeah, I've been you know wide variety of countries, and there are some cultures I won't I'll leave them unnamed that tend to be a little more serious. Some even tend to be a little dour, rigid. That <laughs> some are, some tend to be a little rigid. But dour and, and serious to be one type, whereas that's not the Filipino culture. Ah, yes. It's a culture of the easy enjoyment and welcome. Yes. You know, the, it's a, I always, the, the Filipinos always struck me as very welcoming people that are delighted to be with you. Yes, that's why, you know, when I was reading Evangelio, Evangelio Jum, no, and uh, uh, I was, you know, slowly reading it, there were times I would smile when the Holy Father would talk about the joy of the gospel. He would use words and images no, that I think would really touch base with the Filipino people. For instance, mm -hmm. he would say that uh, uh, if you will proclaim the joy of the gospel, you must not uh, 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 be like someone who uh, celebrates Easter but is still in Good Friday. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. He wrote about it. Um, for priests, he would say, uh, do not treat the confessional like a torture chamber. Right. See? Or if you are a Christian, uh, show your face as if you did not come out of a funeral. Right. right. These are the words of the Holy Father. Right. So, right. Uh, and he coins terms you know, that um, I think... Um, um, would strike us also like if you're a Christian you should not be bat like <laughs> like you know like a bat uh, yeah like a bat hiding yourself you must come out see <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, something that you know he, he he really does bring a liveliness from his own experience of Argentina and the Argentine yes, culture yeah. which again as a Catholic culture has that joy of life that does permeate the, the way people are in the culture. Yeah. You know, yeah. And that, that certainly would be something in common with the Philippine, Filipino culture. So I'm looking forward that when Pope Francis comes no, and he will speak spontaneously in whatever language, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he would uh, bring out a lot of humor. Yeah, the, he, what, did they say if he's gonna speak in Italian or his well, English we, well, is not we, so good. We are a f uh, Filipino people. Of course, uh, uh, we're English speaking too, given the, uh, the influence of the Americans, right. given our history. So even our education is English. So hopefully he will be speaking in English like the other right. uh, uh, popes who visited the Philippines. But he, uh, but he might come up with a little bit of Spanish too. Oh yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yes. Because he also had been uh, with the Spanish for a number right, of centuries. Right, right. So, so uh, that's that should be also something that would be uh, <laughs> interesting to see how he just pop, what language he pops out yeah. in. And, but w no matter what, just the joy in his face will resonate with the joy of the Definitely. Filipino people. Definitely, there's there's no doubt of that. And, and we're but, so excited. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. We know we want, uh, very much want to let people be aware of this. Uh, I'll give some of that information again, that the, uh, the visit of Pope Francis to the Philippines will take place January 15th to the 19th. And if you want to find out more about it, you can go either to www.people visit.ph or you can go to our website ewtn.com thank you very much for bringing us this very good news and for joining us here uh we're delighted to have you and we'll, we'll certainly share it please join me in blessing our audience 
May Almighty God bless you and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And you know, we want to remind you that we can bring uh, Bishop Vergaro and all of our other guests and all of our other programs and shows and papal visits because this network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you.